Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Asha Rajan. I'm an associate at Tenye Peak. Uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to an event co hosted by Nishit Desai Associates and Tenye Peak titled The Nuts and Bolts of Enforcement in International Arbitration Snapshots from India and France. This year's Paris Arbitration Week has certainly been a rather strange one in the context of the global pandemic. One silver lining, however, is being able to host this event on a platform where people from across the world who may not have otherwise been able to join us are now able to participate in this event. So on that relatively positive note, let me introduce first our topic for today, followed by our experts on the panel. And finally, I'll provide a quick roadmap on how we will approach this discussion. The first question is, why do we choose to focus on enforcement in these two jurisdictions? Bilateral commercial relations between India and France have been thriving. The past decade has seen a steadily growing interest in expanding trade in both goods and services between the two countries. France has emerged among a as a major source for FDI in India with more than a thousand French establishments already present in India. French companies in India are active in a large variety of sectors, services, cement, pharmaceuticals, automobiles, industrial machinery, drugs, etc. However, the two legal systems could not be more different. I experienced this firsthand as an Indian lawyer who subsequently qualified in France. And what's surprising is that these differences translate to approaches taken towards international arbitration as well by both systems. While you may ask, um, do we need to understand these differences? Well, a deeper understanding can bring about more investor confidence and hopefully a further deepening of these trade relations. From personal experience at Senior Peak, we have been approached by several French companies who have been present in India for many years now, but are still quite flummoxed with the hows and whys of how the system and the judiciary work. And so with this session, we hope to bridge that gap just a little bit in today's webinar with a focus on a firmly practical aspect of international arbitration, and that is the enforcement of awards. With that in mind, please let me introduce um, the panel. First, we have uh, Payal Chatterjee. She is currently a senior member of the International Dispute Resolution and Investigations Practice at Nishi Desai and heads the firm's European practice. Payal specializes in commercial litigation, international arbitration, and cross-border disputes, where she represents and advises various multinational corporations across a wide range of sectors, including IT, telecom, infrastructure, media, and entertainment. Next, we have Sahil Kanuga. Sahil is currently co-head of the International Dispute Resolution and Investigations Practice at NDA. He's part of the Asia Advisory Committee the American Arbitration Association International Center for Dispute Resolution. He's a member of the Singapore International Mediation Center Specialist Mediation Mediator Panel for India. He's been recognized as client-focused, solution-oriented, and under the Who's Who Legal Guide as a future leader in arbitration. Finally, I turn to Rafael Kaminsky, partner at Senior Peak. Rafael specializes in commercial litigation and international arbitration. He has developed a focused practice in the field of private international law in areas such as obtaining evidence and serving judicial and extrajudicial acts abroad. Hafal features among the list of future leaders also published by Who's Who Legal. As for me, um, as a lawyer qualified both in India and France, uh, this topic hits close to home, and I also hope it will be informative for all of you. A very quick roadmap on how we will proceed today. I will put to our panelists certain questions relating to enforcement of um, arbitral awards, and they will respond based on the approaches taken in their respective jurisdictions. We encourage you, members of the audience, to please send in your questions by using the live chat box, uh, which should be on the side, which says Q&A. And we will try and address them either through the presentation or at the end of uh, our at the end through a question and answer session. As a final comment, uh, the session is being recorded, and links to the recording will be shared soon after. 
So with this, let's start with our first question. Um, my first question is to all three panelists. Um, the first question, most parties across jurisdictions prefer arbitration rather than approaching courts. But the question of enforce enforcement arises once you have the award, how do you enforce it? Enforcement becomes critical in a lot of jurisdictions, especially when parties are un unwilling to voluntarily comply with the arbitral award. So how would you advise your clients and help them strategize? And here, I'd be glad for both perspectives, India and in France. So, Rafael, would you like to take the French perspective first, or would you like me to take the Indian one? You can start, Sahil. Lovely. Thank you. So, thank you, Asha, and good morning to everyone. It is our pleasure to meet you this morning, virtually, of course. We join you from Mumbai, and we're in our fourth month of lockdown. Very, very tired, but speaking. I'm sure many of us were hoping, uh, we're looking forward to meeting in Paris. That will have to wait for next year when hopefully all of this is behind us. Now, moving on to the question. Now, the growth of international commerce has essentially necessitated the creation of efficient methods of dispute resolution in India. Uh, it's well known that the courts are quite clogged. This means that arbitration has become the preferred mode for dispute resolution, especially in high value or cross border contracts. So the awareness of arbitration and its benefits exist in some form. Now, once you get that award, it's as good as a decree of an Indian court. But, and this is a big, big but, in the Indian context, that award may only be half a battle won. Before we jump in and discuss this, there is one major speed breaker that we should be aware of. While India is a signatory to the New York and Geneva Conventions, it only treats those awards as foreign awards, which are passed in countries, which are signatory to the convention and also declared as a reciprocating territory by the Indian government. So out of about 160 odd signatories to the New York Convention, only about 55 odd countries are declared to be reciprocating territories. So for the rest of the countries, well, an award passed in such a country cannot be enforced in India as if it were a decree of an Indian court. So upfront, if your award is passed in a country that isn't a reciprocating territory, it will not be recognized and enforced as if it were a decree of an Indian court. You will need to evaluate alternate options. It's not unusual to have situations where the judgment debtor decides to not participate in the arbitral process or even abandon it midway. The enforcement of these awards where the party is absent can sometimes be more complicated than one where the opposite party has participated and defended the proceedings. In some situations, objections have been raised even against costs awarded by the tribunal or the jurisdiction of the tribunal. Therefore, the stage of enforcement of an award or decree warrant a high degree of caution. You need to see the award and understand the process that was taken to arrive at it. Also keep in mind that you need to make it simple. An executing court cannot go behind the award. It does not have the power to modify the term and must take it as it stands. On the strategy part of it, in India, there is no culture of voluntary adherence to an award or a decree. You need to go in for enforcement. Every decree or sorry, every award is going to be challenged wherever it is and expect that. You need to evaluate the judgment data and evaluate where the assets are located. You need to build up the pressure because it is only when the judgment debtor feels the pressure will he come to the table. The process of recognition and enforcement can take some time. It is not inconceivable that a mischievous debtor would try and dissipate their assets. So in such situations, one must consider seeking some kind of interim relief, protecting the award holder. That's the starting point of strategy. Can you obtain a stay on the dissipation of assets? And where assets are not known, can you get an order of disclosure of the assets, which will eventually lead to an order of stay on the dissipation and then move towards sale of those assets? These kind of orders build up the pressure and make the judgment debtor comply. Your mm -hmm. general modes of execution in India are delivery of any property that specifically decreed, attachment and sale of property, or appoint a receiver. Now, in our experience, once you have this injunction, you will find most judgment debtors come to the table to try and resolve the matter. You will see your money. 
That's the Indian context. Mm -hmm. Sahil, I, I will start with asking a question, but would you do that, these interim measures, after you got the award or during the arbitration proceedings? So when you're enforcing it, you need to bring the award in. So when you, uh, I'll actually deal with that as part of my next question, which is yeah. the process of enforcement. The process of enforcement, yeah. So okay. I can jump into that, but uh, would you like to discuss the French angle first? Sure. Well, I think we, we're really close in the strategy. Like, um, uh, of course, France is also a, a member and a signatory of the New York Convention on Enforcement of uh, Foreign Awards. But the, the real question you need to ask yourself is precisely, as you said, where are your uh, betters assets? Um, are they located in a jurisdiction which is a signatory of the New York Convention? If not, it means that the whole process of recognition and enforcement is going to be much more complicated. So in this case, you need to ask yourself whether you even want to go through enforcement and recognition of this award, or whether you may even think of alternative options, uh, such as obviously settlement, such as selling your award to a third party. This is a new trend that, that, have, that, has, uh, um, that, that has happened, or even move to investment treaty arbitration, or search for some diplomatic protection. There are different options that you may explore depending again, uh, on where the assets of your debtor are located. But what we should, we should bear in mind, and that's probably one of the differences between India and France, is that most of the awards are voluntarily enforced. So it's only, we say generally that 90% of ICC awards, for instance, are voluntarily enforced. It means that it's only for the 10 remaining percent that you will need to go through uh, enforcement and recognition proceedings. Um, the good thing about what we just said is that both countries, India and France, are signatory to the New York Convention. So the, the various options that I've mentioned will not necessarily be covered during this webinar. So that's when we go with the strategy part. Um, and then we understand that the processes of enforcement in both countries are differ quite significantly. Um, Rafael, would you care to start up with how it, exp how it uh, occurs in France? And then maybe um, Sahil, Sahil, one if you could step in and explain how it happens in India? Yes. First of all, the first thing we wanted to say is that enforcement can be slightly misleading. Um, we really understand enforcement as either recognizing the award, the foreign award, the international award, as a local judgment or award in the country where recognition and enforcement is sought. And then there's the actual enforcement against the assets of the debtor. And we, we really need to be very uh, wary of the use of, of these terms. So we really have a two steps process. So the first thing we need to do uh, in, in France when you want, when you have your international award, which is simply a piece of paper at that point, is to um, ask uh, basically the, uh, a, a specific judge, and we'll turn to who this judge is, uh, to enter into an order that gives the value of a local ruling to this international award. This is what we call exequatur in Latin, enforcement, uh, literally, of the award. Uh, and for this, it is an ex parte proceeding, so this is one of the specificities of, of the French system. So the award creditor goes by himself to the judge and basically simply have to give um, a copy of the award or the original end copy and the arbitration agreement plus a sworn translation or translation if it is in a foreign language, and simply need to handwrite on the first page of the award that this is the application to have the award enforced in France. And that's it. The judge will then have a prima facie look at the award just to check one point whether this award is contrary to international public policy, which is a very restrictive notion. It has to be an award basically that would uh, allow uh, uh, slavery uh, or goes against so very serious values uh, which are contrary to the, to the values of the French system that it would not be uh, an, enforced and recognized. So basically, any award in France will be recognized on an ex parte basis. Um, and this is also why this is such a pro arbitration uh, uh, system. And then if we if we want to challenge the uh, this award, and if we want to ask for this award to be set aside, it will be for the award debtor to bring an action 
to ask this award to be set aside and we'll go through the various conditions that need to be uh, set out. Second thing, because again, again, because of these notions of enforcement, once you have this award uh, recognized, then you can start doing enforcement measures with it. You can go directly with the bailiff and do some attachments on the assets of your debtor. So this is a very efficient system uh, and very powerful system that can go very quickly. Sahil, would you like to step in? And because here is where the cleavages between the two systems become quite apparent. So would you like to, uh, Sahil, Pai, would you like to step in? Sure. So I'll discuss the, the, process, uh, the procedure for enforcement of arbitral awards in India, which is basically governed by the Arbitration and Conciliation Act 1996, which follows unicetral model law. Uh, essentially, uh, domestic and foreign awards are enforced in the same manner, that is, as if they were a decree of an Indian court. Um, a foreign award is governed by provisions of Part 2 of the Act. Uh, broadly speaking, the enforcement of a foreign award is a two-stage process, which is initiated by filing a single execution petition. You just need to file one document, it's called an execution petition. Initially, a court determines whether the award adheres to the requirements of the Act. And once it is found to be enforceable, it is recognized, and it is then enforced as if it's a decree of that particular court. Mm. Uh, at that point, uh, provisions of the Code of Civil Procedure kick in, and you can enforce it as if it's an Indian decree. One should be mindful of the various challenges that usually arise, such as ob objections taken by the opposite party. And the requirements, such as filing of the original or authenticated copy of the award and the underlying arbitration agreement before the court. A few of the steps that are crucial for ensuring successful enforcement are one, making effective service on the opposite party or the judgment debtor, which is mm -hmm. crucial to prevent objections at a later stage. You can't do this ex parte. Taking necessary steps by way of attachment, notice, arrest, appointment of the receiver, or in any other manner. This is what okay. we discussed about interim relief, because that's the starting point of effective strategy. And the third thing, always keep in mind that the principles of natural justice apply even to execution proceedings. Uh, it's very easy to have an order set aside in a higher court simply because you fail to serve the other side. While it's tempting to go ex parte, uh, in the Indian context, it is something best avoided. Mm. Of course, that makes sense. Um, and that ties in with my next question, uh, which is which courts can we approach for the enforcement of awards? And is there a threshold or test that needs to be met to get uh, an award recognized and enforced? And this question is, I guess it makes more sense to start with the Indian approach first. Um, and we can highlight the differences through our conversation. Thank you, Asha. Good morning, good afternoon, and evening to everyone who is joining our session today from various parts of the world. Uh, I think Sahil has put it very well when it started with the enforcement and recognition process in India. It's a combined application which you do. But the question is, in several judgments and through jurisprudence in India, the term enforcement is used as something which includes execution within it itself. If it's a combined application, the court together has to deal with both processes, enforcement and execution of the award. Now, as India has been infamously known for delayed litigation, and in, even in cases when it comes to enforcement, the first layer of the litigation could itself be whether you have approached the right court or not. So it becomes very tricky that you don't lose out even more time after you have got an award, at least deciding which court should I go to to get my award enforced. So Finally, in the last, I would say, couple of years, we have got some kind of finality as to which is the court which needs to be approached. And we have had recent rulings from the Supreme Court, which have laid down a test, which court needs to be approached when specifically it comes in the context of a domestic award or an international commercial arbitration mm. award. In the context, I, we would specifically deal with foreign awards today. It depends on 
where the assets of the opposite party are, depending on that, you would go to that particular court. But since India has 29 states, that many civil courts which are there in existence, do you go forum shopping and decide, okay, this civil court, I will go ahead and decide that. Three years back, we had the introduction of the Commercial Courts Act as well, which works together along with the Arbitration Act to decide which forum you're approaching. We have clarity now that we go before the High Court, but thankfully, we have now have a commercial division in the High Court itself, which is equipped to deal specifically with commercial matters, intellectual property matters, and also arbitration related matters, whether it be about enforcement or about interim measures. But if it's an international commercial arbitration, proceedings related to that would go before the commercial division of the High Court. There's a catch over there as well. Now, if it's a simple money decree or a money award which has been come, you mm. can go ahead and before the sue, uh, I would say the jurisdiction where this other opposite party has its assets, you can go before that commercial division of the high court. But if it's anything other than money, then it will be treated in the same manner as if in the case the court would have jurisdiction if it were a normal suit. Accordingly, you go before the commercial division of that high court to go ahead and enforce your award. Rafael, your thoughts on how it works in France? It's probably slightly more straightforward in that respect. And, and this is where we have the distinction again be, between the recognition itself and then the enforcement. Um, when we're talking about recognition, the, the, the French uh, Civil Procedure Code provides specifically that the president of the civil court of first instance where the award was rendered has exclusive jurisdiction. Uh, when we're talking about uh, an award which has been rendered abroad in India, for instance, then it is the president of the court of, of first instance of Paris who has exclusive jurisdiction to and to recognize and enforce the award. But then when we're turning to the enforcement itself of the execution, then we will also have uh, to go to the court where the assets are located. But we will go back to this point uh, in just a few minutes. Uh, we just need to add something more uh, because under the French system, we have this duality of courts between the civil and criminal courts on one on the one hand and the administrative courts on the other hand. And we, we've recently had a ruling um, that, that explained that as soon as any mandatory rules of French public law related to the occupation of public land or rules governing public expenditures are at stake in, a, in an award, then we have to go to the administrative court of first instance, which will have exclusive jurisdiction. So it really creates a new twist that didn't exist before that. It used to be only the, 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 the civil courts that handle this issue of, of recognition and enforcement. And now we have a dual system with the administrative courts and the civil courts, which, which do not handle things the same way. So we, we can come back to that later on. Um, and and as, I, as, as I explained earlier, um, the, the requirements for this recognition are extremely limited and apart from the regional of the, um, of the award and the arbitration agreement, you need only have this very limited prima facie review by uh, the, uh, the court, the president of the court of the compliance of the award with French international public policy. I think that brings us quite beautifully to the meat of it, um, which is what are the grounds available to for parties to resist enforcement um, and both interestingly both jurisdictions in the past i think in the, in the past five years have shown uh, an, an evolution and significant and surprising evolutions in this regard so once again what are your thoughts with india with france how do we deal with this issue okay so you're right this is the meat of the matter now, at the outset, it's important to keep in mind that when it comes to India, we've seen the courts adopt a very strong pro-arbitration stance over the last decade or so. This came from a variety of reasons, but one of the major reasons has been the increased sophistication of the Indian judiciary when it comes to handling global agreements and disputes. Ex experience has been an excellent teacher for all of us, including the judiciary. Now, there were also a few judgments which were very heavily criticized uh, domestically as well as internationally. And this helped in the, the course correction that the world saw. 
So in that sense, it's now extremely rare to have a situation where the enforcement of a foreign award is successfully resisted. So the starting point is it's it's very difficult to resist a foreign award in India. What do you see when you see traditional defenses in these proceedings? Now, these are usually violation of principles of natural justice, and this is especially true in ex parte awards, uh, violation of public policy, uh, absence of uh, arbitral agreement, uh, the agreement isn't in writing, uh, any pathological errors in the arbitration agreement, things like that are your traditional defenses. Mm -hmm. The legal defenses uh, on which uh, enforcement of a foreign award may be refused are only those grounds set out in Section 48 of the Act, and this is watertight. You can't go beyond that. The, I, the Supreme Court has said it in multiple uh, judgments, and this is something that follows uh, UN model law. So very briefly, uh, the parties to the agreement were under some sort of incapacity or the agreement is not in accordance with the law to which parties have subjected it, uh, failure to give proper notice, the award is ultra-virus, the agreement or the submission to arbitration, uh, the award travels beyond the scope of submission to arbitration, the composition of the tribunal is ultra-virus, uh, the award has not yet become binding on the parties or has been set aside or suspended by a competent authority. Uh, subject matter of the dispute is not even capable of settlement by arbitration under Indian law or where enforcement of the award would be contrary to the public policy. Of India. Now, I saved the best for last, obviously, because the issue of public policy is the principal ground on which uh, an award is uh, resisted. And the definition of public policy is something that the Supreme Court of India has set out in 1994 in a judgment called Reno Sagar, which is still considered good law, but it's, we're lawyers, we will consistently test boundaries. So I'll give you an example of two recent cases. In February 2020, we had a case in the Supreme Court called Vijay Karya, where the court took a very strong pro-enforcement stance. In fact, it was so strong that the court went ahead and imposed very, very heavy costs on the judgment debtor for wasting the time of the court for even challenging it. It emanated out of four uh, LCIA awards. In April 2020, just two months later, you had another case where a foreign award against a government entity, uh, I think it's the National Agriculture Federation of India, the court actually allowed enforcement to be resisted. They held the award to be unenforceable. And this was a London Seaton, uh, London Seaton Federation of Oil Seeds and Fats Association Award. This NAFED judgment has come to be analyzed quite critically. We are still seeing how the situation evolves, but I think this is the, the most recent case where enforcement was successfully resisted. Uh, the general feeling that is coming out of this is that it is an aberration in a long-standing pro-arbitration trend. So that's how I would like to see it in the Indian context. But um, that's the short point on uh, the grounds on which you can resist enforcement. And Sahil, just a follow-up question on that. Is the, is the fact that it was a, a public entity related to the refusal to enforce the award, in your opinion, or was it on strictly legal uh, matters that it was ruled upon? It certainly opens the door to questions. Interesting. So as for France, and, and, and as we said, because the application for the recognition is made ex parte, everything, every possibility to resist the, the enforcement will come afterwards. So once you obtain this order, you need to serve it on the other party. And the other party will have the ability uh, either to appeal this order or to move for the setting aside of the award. And in, in these two conditions, we only have five grounds and five uh, possibility for the debtor to challenge and resist the enforcement of the award. Uh, either because the arbitral tribunal wrongly upheld or declined jurisdiction, that's the first ground. The second one is because the tribunal was irregularly constituted. The third ground is because it ruled without complying with the mandate which had been given to him. Four is due process requirement, which were not uh, respected, and eventually the other big issue in the French law, like in India, if recognition or enforcement of the award would violate international public policy. 
And I think that's one of the distinguishing features between India and France. Uh, in India, if I understood correctly, we're not talking about international public policy, but simply public policy. So if the award is against public policy, then it may be set aside. In France, you will need to violate international public policy. So that's just a higher step. Uh, it's not simply French rules of public policy, but really rules which are held by the French courts to be so important that they're ruled as being part of the international public policy. Um, and what we need to know also, because France, as we said, is a very pro-arbitration jurisdiction, but things might be evolving uh, over the last few years. Uh, over the past, basically, there was more a maximum of 10% of the awards which were set aside uh, or annulled uh, um, in, in the context of setting aside actions. For the last two years, this level has reached over 25%. So it's a much higher rate of uh, uh, annulment setting aside of, of uh, arbitral awards, and it has been particularly noticed in in large investment treaty uh, awards, uh, like in the Rosoro or the Garcia or the Belocon cases, uh, where the Paris Court of Appeals, who was in charge of, of those cases, decided to set aside the award. And in some of these cases, either for jurisdiction basis or for public order. Um, and the, the one case I'd like to talk about, because it's, it's very interesting to see how the different jurisdictions are handling the exact same question, is a, a, a quite recent case, which is called the Alstom versus ABL case, which was heard by the French courts, the Swiss courts, and recently by the High Court in, in London. And, and it is very interesting to see um, how this, the same case was handled so differently from one jurisdiction to the other. Uh, and it shows how now France even though they're not doing a de novo review for the entire award when, when they're having a setting aside action, they're really doing a de novo uh, review and even sometimes go further than the arbitrators went uh, when it touches upon uh, corruption. Here in this particular uh, matter, it was a case against Alstom, a French entity, against one of its former agents in China, uh, who basically had helped Alstom securing contracts with China and was asking for the payment of commissions. Uh, and there was a whole context of whether those uh, contracts had been secured through corruption and whether this agent uh, had been participating into this corruption scheme. Um, the arbitral tribunal, which was seated in Geneva, found that there was no proof of corruption and that uh, there was not sufficient elements to consider that the contract had been obtained through corruption and therefore ordered asked them to pay uh, the amount of the contract. Um, the Alstom went before the Swiss courts, the, 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 the courts of the seat of the arbitration, which more or less uh, validate 99% of all arbitral awards with, which come before them. And in this case, as in most other cases relating to corruption, the Swiss court said that the arbitral tribunal had done its job and that uh, it had nothing to say more and just dismissed the, um, the setting aside action. Uh, then, because Alstom is a French company, uh, the, 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 the award creditor went to France. And here, uh, the French courts decided first to reopen uh, the, 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 the evidence subject and ask the parties to bring new evidence to verify whether the red flags that had been identified by uh, Alstom and by the arbitrators in the award were actually uh, in it really elements showing that it could be some corruption. And it went through a whole evidence and document production process in the context of the appeal of the enforcement order. And, and after reopening the debates and, and obtaining this document production, the French Court of Appeals ruled that there was sufficient element to determine that this contract could have been obtained and that there was sufficient element to prove that it, it had been obtained through corruption and decided therefore to annul uh, this uh, enforcement order. So mm -hmm. you see how interesting it is. So the, 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 the award creditor got this enforcement recognition order. It went and it was able to, to attach the assets of Alstom. And then Alstom was able to bring this appeal against this attachment and, and this enforcement order. And as a result of this decision, the uh, enforcement order was annulled and therefore all the attachments went off. And just for the for the little story, the, the, the case then went to the High Court, who found that there was no uh, 
corruption, there was no sufficient element of corruption, and that the French decision should not be uh, binding on, on, on the High Court. And I think this um, ties in quite beautifully with our next section, our next discussion, is that procedural requirements for the enforcement of an award. <clears throat> and the all-important question is that when can we go ahead and enforce an award that is challenged at the seat of jurisdiction? Um, here again, I think there are some surprising differences between the two countries. Well, not surprising, but like there are stark differences between the two countries. And maybe Rafael, you want to? Would you like to continue, and then uh, Thail or and or Sahil could step in? Yeah, sure. Uh, so we're going to make it very simple and quick. Uh, even if there is a setting aside action, you can still enforce. It does not suspend the enforcement uh, of the award. Um, and you can only ask for an adaptation or suspension in very, very, very extraordinary circumstances, basically, where you can prove that enforcing it would severely prejudice uh, your situation. And this is a very exception, exceptional situation, and it's only granted in, in, in a very, very limited number of cases. Uh, however, when you enforce and that there's a setting aside action or an annulment proceedings on the side, you enforce at your own risks. So, if in the end the award or the enforcement order has been annulled or set aside, then you will need and you may be exposed to pay damages to the award debtor. Um, and the last thing, which is very important and very specific to France, is that no matter what happened, even at the seat of the arbitration, this will have absolutely no impact on the pending uh, French proceedings. Even if the case has been annulled by the jurisdiction of the seat of the arbitration, this does, not, this does not impact the enforcement proceedings in France. And even worse, you can start enforcement proceedings even once and after the award has been annulled at the seat of the arbitration. Thank you, Rafael. I think this answer is going to be highly controversial when it comes to the Indian context. There's a stark difference. The Indian judiciary views the situation very differently. I'm going to take a couple of minutes out here to explain the different scenarios that play out when it comes to a situation where maybe a proceeding is pending in the seat court or the award has already been annulled. There are two different scenarios which play out. The Indian Arbitration Act, the part two, specifically deals with enforcement of a foreign award. There is no provision for setting aside a foreign award, but only something where you can resist the enforcement of the award. Now, the grounds which are replicated in our Arbitration Act are picked up from Article 5 of the New York Convention itself. One of the, inter, uh, I mean, I would say the main grounds which are there for resisting enforcement is which is public policy, which Sahil has already dealt. The second is, if the award has not yet become binding on the parties, or if it has been set aside in the court, uh, seat court itself. Now, interestingly, there's not a lot of jurisprudence in India when it comes to dealing with this particular situation. You have the ground enumerated in your legislation, but not practically courts have looked into it. Now, the Indian courts have taken a view that if it is the court, where, which, has, which is the seat of the arbitration itself, in that particular scenario, if there is no further provision of appealing that particular judgment, or it has, by virtue of it having attained the finality and binding nature, what happens is the, there is no legal validity to the award any longer. The award doesn't exist. So if it's a country which has set aside the award and that's a reciprocating territory, how I will look at it is two concepts. I have the big comedy between two international countries. I need to respect that and not cross my boundaries. Second, if it has attained finality and binding nature, the concept of res judicata comes in. Because if the award has been set aside and that's a final ruling from another court, if it meets the thresholds which are given under our Indian Civil Procedure Code of having a final judgment or a foreign judgment equivalent, that means it has attained finality, binding. I no business Indian court to intervene and set aside that particular judgment and intervene with the award itself and go ahead with the enforcement. So Indian courts would be very reluctant to actually go ahead and enforce an award which has been annulled. 
But suppose if we have a proceeding going on in the seat court, it's mm -hmm. not yet annulled, it's pending. There is a provision under the act itself which allows you to stay for the proceedings from the enforcement. Ask for an adjournment. Mm. Now, I can tell one of the examples. Uh, I would say, luckily, we have been part of one of the big proceedings which happened in India a couple of years back, where NDA was representing the Russian Federation. Now, obviously, this was the Yukos matter. It's not a pure play commercial arbitration to talk about. So there were several other thresholds which had to be crossed for it to even qualify as a foreign award. Considering India has raised reservations when it comes to the award being commercial in nature, mm. whether it's a separate treaty or it is within the ambit of a New York convention itself. Now, even if you cross those thresholds, the next threshold is if I have an award which is pending litigation in the seat court, can I ask for an adjournment? Now, this matter, I would say luckily for NDA, and it was a big win, did not have to go through this arguments itself to test the legal validity of it. The other opposite party withdrew their petition itself. They initially started off with asking for a stay of the proceeding and looked into other jurisdictions like UK, where they had actually adjourned it for six months. The jurisdictions like France and Germany decided, no, it doesn't matter what's happening in Netherlands. We still can go ahead and enforce the award over here. The Indian judge in, before the Delhi High Court interestingly said, I am not bound by what these other jurisdictions are doing. I'm going to look at the law, what is there in my country. My country says, as long as it's been set aside, not filed an appeal challenging that judgment itself, there is no award which is in place. The mm. judgment is the final ruling. So there is nothing there for me to actually enforce. And as a result, the Indian courts decided not to go ahead and enforce the award. So I think that two parameters work parallelly, where you ask for the proceedings on the ground that it's actually pending and for, uh, pending the challenge proceedings. And at the same time, where it says it's not binding, suspended by an authority, or it is set aside, these two rules actually work hand in hand when it comes to an enforcing court to decide whether they want to go ahead and enforce. I think, you know, just to add to what Payal said, uh, there's another very interesting example which we saw uh, from the Delhi High Court. It's a, uh, an international, uh, it's a foreign award in the case of Daichi. It's mm. public knowledge, so we can talk about it. Uh, it was a Singapore seated arbitration. Uh, there was an award passed against certain Indian promoters. Uh, the award was challenged uh, before the Singapore courts, uh, but pending such a challenge, which was uh, going on for quite some time, uh, the award was brought to uh, the Delhi High Court for enforcement. And I remember there were uh, numerous orders that were coming out of the Delhi High Court of uh, uh, disclosure of assets. There was a, uh, some sort of injunction on the assets also. There was uh, essentially the promoters were being put to terms pending the challenge. So I think the court is not uh, the court will not hesitate in uh, going ahead and enforcing it. They will look to see uh, what is the state of affairs at the seat of the arbitration. Um, I yeah, so just to intervene before we yeah. move on to the next point. I think there's an, another interesting layer in India, especially mm. when it comes to enforcement against the state, right. which could apply equally for an investment treaty arbitration. Now, if it's a state, there is a concept in our procedure which requires you to take a prior approval because mm. states are supposed to be granted sovereign immunity. Now, if you're proceeding against the state and going ahead and attaching their assets, you need an approval from the government over here. It's sort of in the form of a certificate. It's a procedural requirement, but that is like one of the thresholds which are required to be complied with before you go ahead and enforce it against the state. And this would be uh, our curiosity. Where would this uh, certificate be obtained from? Which where would you? Which office would you go to? Yeah. So this interestingly is based on the provision of the Civil Procedure Code. You go back to the Ministry of External Affairs itself. Mm. They are supposed to issue you that certificate. That now you have obtained it, you can go ahead and proceed against the particular state for whom you are against, against whom you are seeking the enforcement. Mm. This is okay. interesting. Sorry, Would you like to? Is there any difference uh, between um, awards against states, awards uh, or commercial, purely commercial 
that you would like to highlight or the lack thereof that you'd like to highlight? Yes, absolutely. Uh, again, at the stage of, of recognition and enforcement, the first step, there is absolutely no difference. You will still uh, obtain your order against a commercial party or a state. Where it changes everything, and that's a, quite a recent change, it dates back mm. to 2016 in France, uh, it's when you want to actually enforce, execute the uh, enforced award against the assets of the state in France. And there you also need a, an authorization, but you need an authorization from the judge and not from the government, but from the judge. Uh, and, and you need to prove um, that actually the assets are commercial assets that can be attached uh, either because of their nature or because the state has waived uh, its, its immunity, um, its uh, an enforcement immunity against you. So it, it creates a, a new threshold because um, for a commercial award, you would simply go to the bailiff and the bailiff would attach the uh, the assets once you've obtained your, your enforcement order. Here, you need a prior authorization of the judge. Uh, it's still an ex parte uh, proceedings, but you need to convince the judge and then there can be a whole resist, uh, resistance once the, uh, the decision has been ruled upon and, and you've attached the assets, then the state may move uh, to challenge the uh, attachment before the, the, the judge and the court that ordered uh, such attachment. Um, and, and here again, uh, we, we, we have some new rules about which court to go to. Um, mm. And in particular, the, what we call the enforcement judge uh, in, in Paris has, again, a much larger uh, jurisdiction over of uh, sovereign assets um, in, in in France. Mm. Um, I think if the, uh, we can, the next question that we'd set out for the purpose of our discussion today is one that might be of uh, particular relevance in the context that we're in, uh, unfortunately. But what would you? Uh, Sahil, uh, Pael, uh, Rafael, what would you advise your client if the opposite party goes bankrupt? Um, this itself is a, it's, it's a huge issue, I understand that, but it might be one that will become increasingly pertinent um, soon. So, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, thanks, Asha. I think, as you rightly said, it could be a, another one-hour webinar if the interplay of insol insolvency and bankruptcy laws and the Arbitration Act itself. Mm. So in India, it's been the last three, four years that we have actually a new insolvency and bankruptcy code itself. There are no provisions in the Arbitration Act which deals or talks about the interplay of these two legislation. But the basic principle is the minute a corporate debtor is going through the insolvency process and you have the insolvency resolution professional appointed and you start ticking the clock like the moratorium is started it's a bar to any kind of proceeding mm -hmm. i think that's the sh simple short answer to it but how it plays out when it comes to arbitration now obviously it's different when it comes to a domestic arbitral award and different when it comes to an international commercial arbitration this is not an area where we have seen too much of jurisprudence. What we mm. have seen is when you're trying to start with insolvency proceedings, whether an arbitral award or an arbitral proceeding is considered as a dispute and therefore you, it acts as a dispute and therefore you don't go ahead with it. But not the other way around where you have an arbitration proceeding ongoing or you have an award in place. Now what happens thereafter? We, how the Indian courts I think we just have two or three rulings which talk about how Indian courts will look at the situation and they are of the view if the moratorium is going on and if the in enforcement is actually going to help the corporate debtor in relation to the moratorium, let's go ahead and with the enforcement. But it should not be a situation where they are stripped of their assets and as a result, the moratorium itself is of no relevance. It makes it a futile exercise. Mm. The right. good way, I think the good part, one solution to that is if it's a foreign, I mean, international commercial arbitration, and luckily the opposite party also have assets in foreign jurisdiction, you can go ahead and start enforcing an award in that jurisdiction. Because mm. in India, what might happen is the ground which is there of fundamental policy of Indian law or the fact that you know it's a moratorium and it requires you not to go ahead with it you could attract that ground as a challenge or as a 
to resist the enforcement itself. Mm. So that goes against you and you're in a situation where you have no relief. Basically, you're stuck, whether it's during the proceeding or after having an award, you basically have no way or no relief which you can obtain from courts in India. Sahil, if you want to add any more on that. No, I think you've covered it all. Um, bankruptcy and arbitration is always going to be a, a difficult interplay. Uh, I think the short point is you have an award and you don't know whether the uh, uh, judgment debtor is going to be around tomorrow. Uh, in some ways, uh, before we start the arbitral process, this is a test that we also do to see whether uh, if an award is obtained, uh, will you be able to enforce it in the first place? Because we have seen situations where uh, certain companies, um, you know, they enter into strange agreements or they tend to siphon money away, especially in larger commercial groups. And in that situation, you wonder whether it makes sense to even initiate arbitration or do you go uh, over something like lifting the corporate veil or something like that? Because at the end of the day, it's a shell company. So even if you spend the time, effort, money uh, going through an entire arbitral process, you're going to be left with a paper award. Uh, so while it may not be strictly bankruptcy, this this veers more into the nature of fraud. Uh, it's a question that you should uh, ask yourself before you even initiate arbitration and certainly before you initiate execution. And you yeah. should see whether you have any other legal remedies available. Absolutely. This, I guess, this also ties in with our first question on um, on strategy. Uh, Rafael, would you? What are your thoughts on on this? And what is the uh, regime in France? Yes, I, I think we're really on the same line. Maybe it's the first time uh, during this webinar on, on this aspect <laughs> of bankruptcy. I, I, I cannot agree more uh, with 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 Sahil and Payel as to the the necessity to to even before you initiate the arbitration to think about who are you going to be the respondents in your arbitration. Um, we, we're lucky enough in France to have a, a, a very large vision of who can be a party to the uh, arbitration agreement and to be able to, to ask for the application of the arbitration agreement, even to non-signatory parties. Uh, and this is generally what we look at when, when we have to, to uh, bring an action against a company within a group. We want to make sure that we have also the right parties and the right deep pockets that against whom you will be able to enforce the award once you get it. This is absolutely crucial because as you rightly fully said, once you've got bankruptcy, you're stuck, you're in trouble. Uh, obviously, you can also look at fraud or piece in the corporate bill, but it's it's the conditions are so strict in the French law that it will be a, a very, very huge challenge to be able to do that. Um, and the only thing I can say, because the interplay, as you rightfully said, is, is, is very sensitive and complicated, but we, we have had one uh, recent ruling from the Paris Court of Appeals in 2019 that said that basically you could ask for the recognition of mm. the award, uh, even if the party who had been uh, condemned, the award debtor, had went into insolvency proceedings in the meantime, but you could not ask for the recognition of the money part of this award, and you could not be able to enforce the money part of the award because of the international public policy principle of the stay of the proceedings once uh, a, a party has, has gone into insolvency proceedings or, or, or is bankrupt. So once again, to avoid being in big trouble with bankruptcy issues with your debtor, you need to think about it way in advance, even before the, the, the arbitration starts, and in any event, before you even think about enforcing the award. Absolutely. Um, I think we have one question from a member of the audience in that, how can an award be recognized and, but still not be enforceable in a given jurisdiction? Uh, I think we can throw the question to both uh, all three of you, if you'd like to step in. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the, the, the question perfectly, but it, the, the award can be recognized um, and found to be uh, basically a, a, a local ruling in, in France, but it might not be enforceable if the debtor has no assets in the country, for instance. That's that's probably one response to the question, but I'm not sure this addresses the actual question. It might be another question that I that is hidden behind the one I'm, I'm seeing here. 
Well, I think in the international context, if you bring a judgment, if you bring an award in and it gets recognized, uh, the chances are it's going to be enforceable because when the uh, when the when the court is seized of the matter and it's going to be testing to see whether it is uh, an award that can be recognized and enforced, it's it's a common test. Uh, it's actually a two step procedure. But the, proce the procedure of execution may take a little bit longer. But uh, I'm not sure whether uh, recognition and enforceability are necessarily in the Indian context going to be two different things. Absolutely. Um, it's definitely been interesting. Answer question. Sorry. I think it might be, but um, I think we have an India specific question, which maybe we can. Uh, deal with now or if you if you'd like to step in Sahil and Tail or we can we can ask separately if you'd like also but the idea of this uh webinar was to focus on international arbitral awards but please if you if there is an answer to give please go ahead do you want me to take this up yes, or you want to answer it in the blog itself because maybe we are running past time so I can answer it there itself Okay. Okay. It's it's definitely been interesting in terms of the conversation to see um, the increasingly what well, France has always had a in the past few decades has had an aggressively pro arbitration approach, and I think back home with India we're getting there as well. So it's interesting to see how these div divisions or these the gaps are being filled with the approaches taken by courts um, increasingly. So with this in mind, any closing remarks from our panelists? Would you like to say anything? Sorry, I couldn't hear you because your voice broke for a second. Can oh, I I'm something? sorry. Um, I'm saying, I was just saying that it's it's been interesting to see how um, France, which has always had a very specifically pro arbitration approach and how that's evolving. And with India, we're getting there, I think, also with the courts taking a more proactive stance and the legislature is also trying to match up to that. Um, is there, are there any closing remarks that any of you would like to make or to see what do you think will be, what do we, what do we, where does this go here? Where does this go ahead in your mind? I think um, the evolution of arbitration, I mean, where did arbitration come about? Because people realize that we need something that, uh, meets the needs of international business slightly better than a domestic court in a particular country. It adds an element of neutrality. Uh, when arbitration came about, uh, it as an animal, it was uh, it offered something simple uh, and uh, very quick, very efficient. I think with time, uh, arbitration has become a very complex, uh, time consuming and expensive proposition. But there is no alternative just yet for parties. So, at least for the foreseeable future, arbitration is certainly here to say to stay. I think the disputes that we are seeing uh, are becoming far more complex. There are many more layers than we could ever have imagined even ten years ago. Um, I think, uh, as an animal, arbitration is certainly the benefits that it brings to the table, especially in terms of enforceability. The piece of paper that allows you to take the New York Convention award and take it anywhere across the world and enforce it, it's unparalleled. So I think from a, a jurisdiction perspective, India and France are certainly moving in the right direction as far as arbitration is concerned. And it would be nice to see if uh, parties, lawyers, and courts become even more welcoming and aware of how arbitration actually operates. Uh, we always talk about having a chat with judges and explaining to them that, look, it needs to be a far more simpler process and it doesn't need to be confrontational or adversarial with arbitration. We are seeing judges put that into perspective now. We're seeing judges say, we don't even want to step in. This is arbitration. You go to the arbitrator. So I think we're definitely moving in the right direction. Just to take Sahil's point a little ahead, I think India of late in the last one, I mean the last decade has seen exactly this. Even if there have been any loopholes in the legislation, the judiciary actually has taken a step forward 
and try to through the rulings itself actually interpret those provisions and give it the right meaning and intention which was there behind drafting it so i mean of late the supreme court except for the minor hiccups which were one or two cases we must have seen but arbitration approach and taking a step forward to ensure that as minimum as possible intervention is there especially in case of foreign arbitral awards so that the, at the end of the day the choice of the parties is respected and there is a finality attached to the arbitral award. This is definitely interesting, especially if you think that these are questions that in France that were being dealt with a, a, a while ago. And whereas now, Rafael, what, what, would, what are your thoughts on where, what could France do possibly to make it an even more attractive um, venue for arbitration? That's a good question. I think I think France has has been for a very long time a very attractive and pro arbitration um, uh, seat. And and the issue I'm I'm thinking about is is rather how can we now make sure this continues? And, and in the wake of what I told you about the the number uh, the increasing number of setting aside awards and in particular investment treaty awards, um, we've seen concerns uh, among the arbitration community as to people wondering whether France is still uh, a pro arbitration and welcoming uh, uh, jurisdiction. Uh, I think it is the case, and 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 the the most recent trend is that uh, uh, the Paris Court of Appeals created an international chamber within the the Court of Appeals, who is now in charge of all arbitration matters, including setting setting aside actions. And it's a chamber in the court before which you can bring evidence in English, you can bring expert to testify. So it's really trying to recreate. The conditions of, of an arbitration, basically, which is much more internationally open because you can you can bring evidence and, and witnesses uh, speaking English or writing in English, but this is always subject to the agreement of, of both parties. So I think the future will tell us how things are evolving and whether the, the creation of these international chambers has helped uh, developing the attractivity of, of, of Paris as, as, a, as a seat of arbitration or not. Uh, what struck me uh, during this discussion is to discover all the ins and outs of, of, of the Indian Arbitration Act and the specificities of the enforcement in India, which I think has evolved a lot over the, the recent years. Um, and I think it reminds us how crucial and, and precious having the right co-counsel uh, and, 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 and local counsel is when it comes <laughs> to enforcement. This is something that we've not really covered, but uh, when you enforce an international award, generally you have to think about the international enforcement of this award and to locate the assets in different jurisdiction and get the right local council to do the enforcement part. Um, and I think it was very precious to see, you know, the different the different specificity of, of each of the two countries, uh, because because our clients, obviously, when they're when they have their award, they think they've won and, and they just realize that a new whole battle, a new war is starting over. Uh, they need to have the right uh, uh, advice and, and, and response. Uh, I, I just wanted to to respond because we we received another question which showed and and asking whether it was contradictory to see that the French uh, law was more exhaustive on the public policy approach, uh, where in, in where the consideration of international public policy as against the Indian position. However, when it comes to enforcement to entertain and in other word, um, it, it is different. What I wanted to clarify because maybe I wasn't clear enough on this point is that. Uh, even if the award has been annulled at the seat of the arbitration, this does not mean that the French court will not look at whether the conditions, and in particular the condition of the international public policy requirement, has not been met. Okay, you have to to make sure that you will be able to prove that the award, the enforcement of the award, does not go against the international public policy principles of French law. But I think it's totally in line with what we've said earlier, because the international public policy is much smaller than the public policy, uh, the local public policy. So it means that there are less grounds for annulling or setting aside the, the award. And basically the rationale behind that is that we have five grounds to set aside an award and the annulment of the award at, this, at the place of the seat of arbitration is not one of them. Therefore, it's not a ground for the annulment or setting aside of the uh, award. And, and, and therefore, we consider that we need to go through our five conditions and, and it will only be set aside if one of these conditions are not met. Okay, I think uh, I think we can move towards wrapping up the discussion. Um, 
this was again once again this was very interesting to see because these are all factors that we need these are the real firm firmly practical matters of when what we do and how we need to advise clients uh, which is why we thought uh, that this panel could be interesting just to see how these things work in different jurisdictions. And I certainly hope that it has been informative for all of you uh, participants. And I would like to thank um, Inish Desai. I would like to thank Sahil Tayal on behalf of Tignia Peak for um, allowing us to go host this event together. Thank and you very much. It's been our pleasure. And we'd like to thank both of you. It's been fantastic hosting with you we really hope to see you next year in paris or to be able to see you in in in, in mumbai or, or in delhi very soon as well and to, to see all Absolutely. of you as well looking forward to that thank you so much thank you to all of you and thank you for thank to you. all the attendees thank you to everyone for joining we appreciate it